Hey, this is Dave Malik for from Professional Audio Design. I'm here at South Beach Studios uh, with Tom Lord Algae um, to uh, get some feedback and input from him on uh, what he's up to lately and also about our Osberger Active DSP monitors. Tom, thanks for uh, hanging out with us today. Yeah, man. Well, thanks for the great monitors. <laughs> they sound really good. I mean, that's a great way to start it, but thanks for great monitors. I mean, we were, we're, I'm very pleased with, uh, with how they sound. Um, I was working f ever since I came here 18 years ago. We had the old Genelex in here, which at the time I thought felt, you know, it sounded pretty good for this particular room. So I, I, I kind of was kicking and screaming a bit when, uh, when Joe Galdo, studio manager, recommended, you know, that we go with some new monitors. Um, but I, I went with his, you know, I went with his judgment and thought, yeah, you know what, we might as well try it, give it a whirl, and uh, was pleasantly surprised when they came in. That's what I, that's what I work for, is, you know, that, uh, to be able to help someone like yourself um, with, with your craft. You know. <laughs> to, be help, to be able to help someone like me go deaf a little bit quicker. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, but not because of your mind, well, <laughs> because those monitors are loud. They're amazing. I mean, the bottom end is earth-shaking, and uh, that was probably what surprised me the most. Um, I really like the concept of the, you know, amplification that's kind of all in one that's made for these particular monitor, monitors rather than a piecemeal system. Um, I think that uh, the amplification that you guys chose and how you built it is pretty spectacular. And I was shocked at the, the sound pressure level that they were able to reproduce cleanly. You know, I, I couldn't get them up to a clip mode. It was so loud. Which is great because you you want that sometimes. Sometimes you have artists that require, you know, to mix with a lot of deep bottom end, and uh, you know, and some of my clients, you know, like to hear it on stun. And uh, even when they had it up at, at ridiculous levels, you know, the bottom end was speaking really good, and I noticed no clipping whatsoever. So I'm very impressed with the with the whole system. That's great to hear. Um, I think they can go up to about 134 dB. Is about as loud as we've measured them without really seeing them distort. Um, so you're, you're right. Um, I, I hope you were at a distance when you did yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. You know, you want to run out of the room at that level. But those clients that we have, we do have customers that ask for that kind of level. Well, I got to tell you, I mean, in, in what I've, well, I mean, obviously I, it's happened over music in the past 10 or 15 years is the bottom end really become, you know, become more apparent and the studios you know, need to uh, put in monitors that are able to reproduce that. Um, so, I mean, they need to be able to reproduce that 30 cycles, or that, you know, right. 40 cycles that, that a lot of the, the modern records are using. So it's really nice to be able to hear that now. And uh, generally I can judge how much bottom end I have by when I turn it up very loud, if, it be if my vision becomes blurry. <laughs> <laughs> from the bottom end that's incredible that's that's the type of, that's how solid the bottom end is it will blur your vision that's awesome. um, which is great which is i mean when you get down to those real low notes especially you know those drops you really want to uh that bottom end to be solid and i mean again if if uh if you've, you've had a good tuner in your room to, to be accurate and uh we have a good tuner he's done a very good job in this room yeah, uh, that would be Ross Alexander. That would be Ross Alexander. Very, very yeah, I think was 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 in, instrumental in, in building this room. So he, he's our local guy, very talented at A, building rooms and B, tuning them. You know, I always tell him, I said, make them sound like the NS10s just with more bottom. And he, he did a really good job with it. You know, because I've always liked that top mid portion of the NS10s, but I just wish that it had more of <laughs> Well, mix it, you know, the system goes down to about 24 hertz. And, you know, I think in today's world where you have Pro Tools, which can represent, you know, low end all the way down to the to, to where our hearing goes, um, working on near fields, you miss that. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, and even with a subwoofer, you know, I mean, unless you have double 18 subwoofers on, on, on NS10s, which is just over the top. You know, that's why they're near field monitors, you know, and that's why you would have these wonderful monitors, you know. And, and of course, we chose silver, which I just think looks really sexy. Yeah, Joe had asked me to match it to a Apple MacBook, um, and so I, I actually had a, a broken MacBook Pro in the office, and we brought it to the painter, and he um, he found a paint that was exactly that aluminum paint. It actually yeah, has they, aluminum in it, so it, yeah, they did a great job. They look awesome. Yeah, it's, it's actually a, a formulation, I believe, for the BMW rim paint. 
Okay. So it's the part, it's the actual Panther. So, so not only did they get loud, they'll fit on a BMW. They will, yeah. Or, or <laughs> at least one, maybe you're, you know, in the back window. You know? um, so uh, out of curiosity, what kind of stuff have you been working on since you've had them? Uh, since I've had them, I've, uh, I just finished mixing an album for Hanson, which is a band I've worked with since their inception. I worked on their first album, and I've done a couple of albums since. And it was kind of a reunion of sorts. Uh, we hadn't really seen each other in probably about... 10 or 12 years wow. and uh it, it up, was huh? yeah and they've actually turned into some great musicians um it was a great time mixing the record because it's one of the few that's come across my plate over recent times that was pretty much completely live performed and with no studio trickery i you know no no auto tune um it sounded really good lots of hammond organ um they, they've really kind of I would describe their new record sounding kind of a little bit between cross between Wallflowers and and the old Stevie Winwood, you know. There's some cool brass arrangements, but but mainly the the the, the bulk of the band is drums, bass, and Hammond, um, which was just so cool. I mean, mixing the old Winwood records back in the day was always good fun because I've always been a big fan of Hammond organ. Um, I grew up listening to Pink Floyd, and I always loved the treatment that they did with the with the organ on the right and the guitar on the left. Um, so I always had an affinity for Hammond. So it was kind of nice that to, uh, to to mix a record that was kind of really organic, you know. And again, well sung. The kids of uh, you know, Taylor and all the brothers have, have turned into to, you know great singers. So it was it was a good time. I bet organ sounds great coming out of those mains. Heck yeah, heck yeah! That I can hear the, all the rumble from the bottom, which was great because I'm like, guys, you know, have you ever heard, heard of a high pass filter? You know, come, I mean, a low-pass filter or whatever the fuck they call it. I always get the two mixed up. It's a high-pass high filter. Pass. You know, you roll a little 50 cycles out of there, and then you, you don't hear the wind noise hitting the microphone from the Leslie. Huh. But, yeah, they, it sounded awesome in the monitors. Um, well, and see, that, that part of, you know, production, if you didn't hear below 50 hertz, you wouldn't know it was there, right? Right, so. and I got to tell you, I hear it all the time. You know, that kind of rumble. Um especially in piano recordings. I'm very surprised that cats aren't rolling off around 50 cycles in pianos because sometimes it's a little annoying if you're listening on it. I mean, at home I have a system. It's a very modest system with some subwoofers, but sometimes you really hear that kind of rumble. And I've always thought, God, it's such an easy fix. But they obviously, you know, if you don't have the monitors to reproduce it, you can't hear it. But boy, now we sure can hear it, which is great. You know, and the bottom end is just nice and tight and solid, which, which I really like. I actually think... You know, having full range speakers in today's digital world, I think, is actually necessary because I hear a lot of records when I put them up on these that I think, wow, someone didn't hear down low. They just didn't hear what was going on there. And there's correct. There's just you know extra stuff, and and that also takes a lot of energy out of the mix. You know, it takes a lot more energy to create a 30 hertz t noise than it does a 100 hertz you know tone or whatever. Um, so I would imagine hearing that helps you clean up your mixes. Absolutely. Well, yeah, you know, those records, those are the cats that are mixing at their houses that don't have the capability of doing that. That's why we always recommend that you come to South Beach Studios and mix with me. <laughs> you want the professional sound? Come to South Beach Studios. I'll put a good spanking on your mix. <laughs> well, you know, clearly... It, it is, but, you, I mean, staying on that point, it's actually, throughout my career, I've over the past 15 years, I've noticed more and more of the cats that are recording their records at home as they they've you know finished their obligations to record deals and start their own record deals and they're recording their albums in either rented houses or or at home you know the demand for a professional mix has become even greater i mean it, it's been awesome my brother chris and myself um have been just super busy over this 10 or 15 year pro tools thing and uh you know, I really love the fact that the artists can go home and they can, or they can record the music without a taxi meter running, you know, of a recording studio and do it in a comfortable manner, in a timely manner that, that they don't feel rushed. Um, but yeah, sometimes when they try and mix it at the house, sometimes they get some interesting results, but it's always great to be able to come in and have somebody, you know, with the fresh perspective, um, which is what I do, you know, blend it in, a, in an environment that's conducive to, to, you know, really critical monitoring. No with problem. some monitors that are capable of reproducing that. Well, and it doesn't hurt to have all these tools that you have surrounding you that, you know, whether they be vintage old cool compressors or EQs or this classic SSLG Plus, uh, which I know when, we put When in did here. you ever think that we would be calling an SSLG Plus a classic? 
<laughs> but it is. It is. It's it's a workhorse. It's been my console. I was introduced to it in 1984 or 85, and I fell in love with it immediately. And I, I've never worked on anything else. Um, I love it because it, to me it's just my blank canvas, you know, but the ease of operation I've always, you know, and the way it's just laid out, I've just been so comfortable on it. Um, do you use a lot of plugins or any plugins, or do you find yourself only using the analog hardware? I do what I call a hybrid. Um, I use my Pro Tools system like a multi-track, but a multi-track on steroids. So I come out of my Pro Tools system and digitally go into my 3348 for that vintage digital sound, and then, and then come right into the console. So between the sound of the 3348 converters which I have a real preference to um, because they, it reminds me of those great, you know, 80s and 90s records. The top end with the Sony D, uh, A to Ds, I'm sorry, D to A's to the, to the top end, I've always just really enjoyed. So then we come into the SSL and blend it from there. But I definitely get in and use, use quite a bit of plugins, you know, almost as a premix kind of thing, you know, and then I will do the rest of the sweetening either with the console equalization or the vast amount of, of outboard gear that I have. So it all depends on the situation. Do you print that all back, the, the processed it, audio? Or do you... Depending on, on the chain of events and how deep I'm getting in, generally I will print it back. If it's just maybe a limiter on a vocal, you know, like uh, 1176 or, or my vac rack stuff, you know, I already have that hooked in, you know, as an insert point on the Pro Tools, you know, and generally what I found with, with my limiters is they have one great setting, so it's usually just set at the great setting, and I never touch it. So it makes a recall, you know, very easy. So it all depends on the situation. It's interesting. You know, it, there used to only be one way to do things. You had a two-inch tape and a console. Yeah. You know, today there's as many ways as you want to work, um, and people find their own way, and uh, you've been doing it the way you like, and I, I'm always just interested in... Do you think, I mean, the, 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 the digital audio workstations have really uh, changed the way iMix, they really allow me to get in a lot deeper, and I got to tell you, it's so much more fun, you know, when I'm doing arrangement changes, you know, that there's the ability to undo it, you know, or save it as another session, you know, and if I'm hearing something in my head, maybe I want to fly a couple of things around, you know, it's nice to be able to do it, and then at least if you have to go back, whereas in the past, in order for me to do that, I used to have to make a copy of the 3348, you know, and it was a little bit more involved, but with the Pro Tools, it's immediate. You know, and especially with the artists, you know, if they go, oh, can you just fly that one word to the second chorus? Sure. You know, I mean, it, it, it does. I really do enjoy the whole thing. You know, your comments about the way people are making records, and, and you know, independently of a producer engineer in their own, you know, rent a house or do it in their house themselves and then, you know, send it to a mixer. I mean, that that's a real change in the music business structure in a way. Um, it seems to also echo the maybe the smaller budgets that people have to work with or independent labels that, you know, today there's so many artists on independent labels. It used to be three to five labels had, you know, 80 to 90% of the work. Yeah. And there was a couple of indies. Now it's, is, is that, you know, are you seeing that in your work? Are, what, are you... Well, what I've found, to be honest, I mean, most of the artists I work with have finished up their deals with major labels and have started their own label and do their own thing. I mean, unfortunately, over the years, Record sales have, you know, have just, they've died, you know, over the past 15 years. Um, I can remember when we, used to, in, in the, in the uh, late 90s and the early 2000s, you know, if, if a record I did sold a million, it was a disappointment. You know, if a record I, I do now sells a million, I'm, I'm very pleased, as well as the artists. Um, so, yeah, the record sales have kind of gone out the window. So now I see the artists, rather than making the record to promote a tour, I'm sorry, rather than doing a tour to promote the record, they make a record to promote a tour. Because their merch and the touring, I think, is where um, th their bread and butter comes in. But, I mean, obviously, they're artists and they need to make music. But they've come to, to I think they've come to peace with the fact that the days of selling 10 to 15 million, you know, copies is... Uh, is, is rare and it's it's you know it's 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 way back there they're they're pleased because now they can make records with the the technology that we have now on a pretty much shoestring budget and start to make money you know at record like a thousand you know or ten thousand or whatever it is yeah. so well that's a that's an amazing shift you know from 1985 when records cost 
hundreds of thousands of dollars right. and you'd have to go to a... You had to go to a professional recording studio. That was the only game in town. And, you know, for the average startup band that might have had a great singer with a great song, uh, but worked at the pizza shop or, you know, drove a taxi... It was difficult. Yeah, it'd be, you know, a hundred hours of work to pay for one hour as a studio time or two hours. You know what I mean? Like, you just... I remember when my first studio sessions, I was making $8 an hour and I had to go to the studio and it was 175 an hour to go to the studio. And that's impossible. You yeah. know? And so today uh, we see, you know, obviously we have a lot of clients that are not building rooms at this level. They're building personal work environments right. and they'll get a couple channels of this quality and, a, you know, great microphone, maybe a small pair of good monitors and, and, and do some stuff on their own. Um, I do feel personally that having that end polished coming from a mix engineer, a mastering, it, it, after that, having a mastering engineer. Oh, well, absolutely, yeah. You know, those things are still not lost. Yeah. Um, although they're not always as appreciated um, un until you hear what that difference sounds like. Right. Well, I mean, again, they, they until they hear the AB, you know, of their, what, what they sent to me prior to me touching it and then what it sounds like, you know, when I've touched it, they're f blown away. They're, they're totally blown away because they never thought that it could come up to that level. You know, but again, when I've been mixing records for 30 years, it's, it's kind of what I do. So it's, and, and I still just love it to death. And uh, the cool thing about the whole, you know, home recording and, and get the equipment getting cheaper is these cats are really going for some, sometimes some different stuff. And, and it's cool because as you talked about with the recording studios at 175 an hour, they don't have that taxi meter that's constantly running, you know, and that pressure of like, come on, we got to do something. You know what I mean? Like if they come in and they're not feeling it, you know, if they're in their own place, it's okay to stop for a day or for eight hours or for lunch or whatever without having to worry about, oh, God, we really have to work. I mean, there's nothing worse than having that pressure of performing, you know, or, or having to give up the goods, you know, if you're not in that state of mind. So it's really helped make some interesting records. And plus with some of these cats, because they're not really professionally trained, sometimes some of the sounds they come up with are pretty damn cool. You know, they... So they're experimenting because, because they... Either they don't know, or because they can, or they have time. Yeah, you know, like cats that put like drum drum mics under garbage cans, you know, just because. Oh, you know what? At the time, it sounded cool, you know. And I always figure out a way to manipulate it and turn it mm -hmm. into something. And maybe it sounds good for like that cheap breakdown sound, you know, filtered drum sound. But just weird stuff like that that I, as a professional engineer, probably wouldn't have gone for. You, you know what I mean? And when I was when I was recording, you know, so it's so it's interesting. So yeah, I get some very cool stuff. You know, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun, and 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 you don't get a better satisfaction or enjoyment. There's no better satisfaction or enjoyment from seeing the artist's face light up when you've done, you know, when when he hears the mix and he's just like, "Wow, that's what I wanted," you know. So I, I really enjoy that. Well, that part of it, the enjoyment factor, I think makes, you know, that, I think that's special to the music industry in a way. You know, if you don't love this, you're not going to be coming in here 12 hours and putting your no. heart in the work. And no. music is a passionate art. And, you know, here it is, the producer's putting his passion in it, you know, and I think that's awesome that that's not lost after 30 years. Um, and it's cool. You know, I, I'm curious when you turn it up after having that perspective with the client and then hearing it on these big monitors, I mean. It's awesome. Yeah. It makes, it's, it's, yeah. When, when I hit it to on the big monitors, yeah, they're usually like, holy shit. You know, but then they immediately go, oh, can we hear it on the Yamahas? You know, because in the old days, they, battery? No, uh, no record. Oh, okay. <laughs> in the old, in the old days, take two, mm -hmm. in the old days, you know, studios kind of hyped up the big monitors, you know, so I've never liked that. So that's why I said I, I had them try and use the, the EQ curve for the NS10s as a starting point for these monitors, obviously with more of that solid bottom end. So they were really pleased that what they heard on the monitors and what they heard on the on the on my other monitors, the NS tens, you know, and then when they took it home, you know, and listened on their computers and their cars, that it was accurate. And of course, I couldn't be happier either. Well, that that means a lot to to us, and that's you know the concept behind the DSP tuning ability it allows a tuning engineer to to really personalize the speaker, Correct. you know, to the studio to your ears, uh, so that it's not hyping the low end. You know, you said, hey, there's incredible low end there, but it's not adding it. It's not coming from the speaker. It's coming... If tuned correctly, if tuned which correctly. which you have the ability to do in the in the software that you have. And, and you know, I mean, look, tuning a room is not my, my area of expertise, 
but when tuned correctly, they are, you know, it gives you a very good real world sound of, of what it would sound like in other places, you know, and that's what I, that's at least how I like to monitor, you know, I don't, I want it to be, you know, the, what I love about these monitors is the, the imaging is beautiful and unbelievable. The bottom end is just so solid and tight, you know, but when I go out to the real world and listen on other monitors, it all is working, you know, there's no surprise. So, and I like that. Accuracy. Accuracy. See, I suppose that was the word I was looking well, for. No, and, and, you know, hearing it, you know, to me, it, there's no point. I mean, if you're trying to make a nightclub, it's high that's a, the right. end is cool. It's a different story. But if you're trying to make a reference monitor to, you know, those are an extension of your of your ears, of your work. Correct. Um, if you want more bass in the track, you don't want it to be coming from the speaker. You want to put more bass in the EQ or you want to add more bass from the track. Um, and then, then it's, no matter where you've listened to it, it's going to come through. But having said nightclub, I mean... The monitors, you know, the bottom end is that solid, you know, and can be adjusted in such a way that if you have clients that want that type of sound, boy, these monitors sure will do it. Well, one of the things that Joe Galdo had said to me was that, you know, you were really thrilled with the with the speakers and the tuning, but so was some of the, the you know, the, the clients that come in in the, in the overnights that are, you know, working out, you know, you're working all day on the type of work you do, but then there's clients coming in here doing island music hip-hop that's right and be stuff with you know huge bottom end that's right but but there's not a switch that you're hitting oh no for the tom sound and no the, you know so the same system can work for both clients that, that oh to me absolutely says a absolutely lot. oh no i was very adamant about because my concern was that if they had two settings that they would forget to switch it back over for my session and then what i thought was my session what my settings would be somebody else's settings and uh that would throw me for a loop but yeah they're that good that they can handle both of those. I mean, primarily I'm mixing rock records, you know, and we get bands like Korn that love to use those 808s and stuff like that and that deep, you know, stuff, which is which is great. Super low. Um, yeah, and I need the monitors to be able to reproduce that. And then again, at night, sometimes when we have the, uh, the hip hoppers in, you know, I mean, it's funny because I'll walk in to the main part of the studio and it's like, man, you could just feel through the wall some of that solid bottom end. So they've done a really... Okay. You're, you're out of memory? Yeah, yeah. Good, I need a drink. <laughs> <Perfect>. Awesome. <laughs> we got plenty. 